My name is um, Olga Mayorova. I'm Chris director. And before I introduce our today's speaker, uh, I would like to announce two upcoming events. On November 11, the annual Copernicus Lecture will be given by Jan Gross, Norman Tomlinson, Professor of War and Society and Professor of History at Princeton University. His lecture is entitled, Making History, an Intellectual Journey into the Hidden Polish Past. Our next Chris Noon lecture will be in four weeks on December the 4th. The presenter will be Yusan Jung, professor of anthropology at uh, Wayne State University. For more information on this event, see the materials on the table near the door as usual, please. And now I'm delighted to introduce our today's speaker. Um, Nora Turker has worked in a variety of positions involving intelligence, analysis, and research, and education. He currently conducts research and analysis of socioeconomic, political, and human rights issues in post-Soviet Central Asia as a consultant for U.S. government agencies, NGOs, and academic projects, and he provides research and reporting to senior national level po policymakers. Nor has, has lived, worked, and done field research in the former USSR for over four years, primarily in my native Uzbekistan, Russia, and Kyrgyzstan. From 2002-2005, um, he was co-founder and director of nonprofit education project in Tashkent, Uzbekistan. He holds an MA in Russian, East European, and Central uh, Asian Area Studies from Harvard University. Noah currently works for Registan Net, a consulting firm that was initially a website, right, that does research and analysis on Central Asia, the Caucasus, Middle East, Russia, and South Asia. Um, please join me in welcoming Nora to Nora Turker to our uh, community, and we are looking forward to your lecture. Um, thank you, Olga, for inviting me, and to Doug, um, I think is the, the original inviter. Um, uh, I appreciate the opportunity, and uh, this is, I said uh, to the class yesterday that I'm a little bit unusual uh, for this sort of speaking gig because I don't have a PhD and I'm not planning on getting one <laughs> at any point. Um, it's just sort of the way that life circumstances worked out for me, but um, I I am just a professional researcher. I do do research for uh, a number of different clients, and it's it's it may be a good example, I guess, for the MA students who are here of some of the other things that you can do um, besides going on to do a PhD. So I'm happy to talk about to do answer questions and things about that afterwards. Um, I do I don't usually include that in my bio, but I am a former intelligence analyst. Um, I'm not doing that at the moment. But some of this stuff um, that you'll see here today was um, was of interest to U.S. government clients too, and there's a fair amount of support for these things, in spite of the fact that I'm about to do, I'm really excited to get to do a fairly long lecture, mostly on Uzbek poetry, <laughs> and believe it or not, I was actually paid to do a lot of that research um, in my time as an intel analyst, so you wouldn't expect there to be an audience or an appetite for that, but um, as long as you can show the ways that it's relevant, and I think all of us who are interested in it understand that it is, um, then then there are they can be convinced. <laughs> um, so a lot of the material that I'm going to talk about today actually was um, is also connected to University of Michigan, um, especially through Pauline Jones Long, one of your great professors here, um, who generously agreed to take over <laughs> part of the administration of this big Harvard Carnegie Foundation 
um, project on Islam in Eurasia. And a lot of what I'm going to talk about today comes from a policy paper that I wrote uh, for that project. So again, these things are sort of abstract and they're literary, but, but these, are, these go into policy. And we'll talk a little bit in the beginning about the ways that these are policy relevant. And then um, I'm thankful for the opportunity today to get to talk about the parts that I really like the most, um, the, the actual nitty gritty of what Uzbeks say to each other when they talk about these things and what they're interested in rather than just the policy implications of these things. But we'll talk about that at the beginning of it. Um, and so I'm going to go through the, the presentation that I'll give is divided into three parts. And I'll make these sort of easy to follow um, by using big block letters and numbering them. <laughs> so our first point, and this is why uh, this, is, this is particularly relevant to policy, is because the security-focused literature of the last 20 years and most assessments by all the Central Asian states tell us that there's an Islamic revival in Central Asia and that this Islamic revival is a security threat or a threat to stability. This is almost universally the way that it's been treated in the past 20 years outside of literature and Islamic studies and anthropology and, and things like that. And these are the folks that tend to have a voice in how policy gets made. So th this assumption uh, that, that this is a great security threat is based on some other sub-assumptions. And the first one is that the growing interest in Islamic revival is a uniform trend that creates predictable outcomes, and that Islam as it existed in Central Asia before was somehow not real. This narrative tells us that as Central Asians are increasingly exposed to Islamic practice in the Middle East, that is, real Islam, they'll reject their own traditions and adopt, quote, foreign ones. And the other thing that this approach does is it, measure, it measures religiosity and makes predictions with vague, overbroad statements about ideological vacuums, mushrooming mosques, and hotbeds of various simmerings. This basic narrative tells us that when more mosques are built, you get more Muslims, and when you have more Muslims, you get more of this, which leads to more of this, which of course leads to this, and ultimately to this. But what exactly is the connection? What's this process? How do you get from the top picture to the bottom picture? This is the part that's generally missing from these assessments. But if we tease it out a little bit, we can see that an approach that proposes Islamic revival unfolds as this kind of uniform, predictable process relies on a number of faulty assumptions. Most of all, it fails to meaningfully interrogate what most Muslims actually say or do in Central Asia, and instead assumes that superficially observable signs like mosque construction are easy proxies for certain religious beliefs and social and political outcomes. First of all, it assumes that Islam is like a dial that can be turned up and down. Mosques make Wahhabis, which makes militants. And that all Islamic revival is more or less uniform. Secondly, it assumes that most of the independent or underground Islamic teaching and media are anti-government and focused on politics specifically, and that it's heavily radical. In other words, the assumption is that it's all Hizbut Tahrir. Finally, it assumes that people are mobilized into Islamist insurgencies mostly for ideological reasons, and that the roots of the problem, like the advent of the Islamic movement in Uzbekistan, for example, are a result of foreign beliefs, or real Islam, as opposed to Central Asian Islam, imported into society, making people suddenly too Muslim to be ruled by secular government. These are very broad oversimplifications, but if you followed the security literature on Central Asian Islam, you're very familiar with these, or in fact on Islam anywhere. So the second broad point um, to counteract this is that in reality, Islam is not a monolith. As many, of this <coughs> as many of us in this room are aware, there's a wide gap suggested by Nick McGorn in 2007 and elaborated by many others since between security-focused literature on Islam in Central Asia and the field work done by scholars working in anthropology, religious studies, and political ethnography. Among the key differences identified here is, a, is that <coughs> the religion as security literature frequently treats Islam in Central Asia as if it's a monolithic object, 
and Islamic revival as a linear trend that leads to these predictable social and political outcomes. But a significant amount of new research in Central Asia instead adopts Talal Assad's interpretation of Islam as a discursive tradition made up of competing authorities and ideas. And as it turns out, this is exactly what we see in Central Asia. Not one Islam or one authority, but many different ideas about proper belief and practice that compete with one another for authority. So these two pictures are a good example of that. This is from field work I did in Kyrgyzstan in 2011. These are two pictures from the same wedding. Um, it's an Uzbek wedding in, a, in an Uzbek mahal on Ash that unfortunately was mostly destroyed during the ethnic violence. So the wedding was kind of a somber thing. This was a year after the violence. It was the first time that they felt safe enough to get together and have a gathering. It wasn't a public gathering. They made sure that they were far away from any mixed neighborhoods. But it was a big wedding and it was a big deal for the families because this was the first time they'd done something like this. And they brought um, a very old <laughs> neighborhood mullah who had gone on Hajj and um, was very well respected. And he did a beautiful nikok, a beautiful Islamic wedding ceremony that was very somber and sacred. And then afterwards, we all went out and had ice cream and danced. <laughs> so <laughs> this is, there was no alcohol. It was, I mean, it was, it still conformed to basic religious norms, but it wasn't as if it was this somber thing where all the men and women had to be separated. Now, a lot of weddings are held that way in Central Asia now. I mean, there, there are many, there's a broad spectrum of, of this. And actually, there's a wonderful article by Julia McBrien called Listening to the Wedding Speaker that a lot of you are probably familiar with, where she talks about the way that weddings in particular are a site of contestation for these different types of authority. But this, I, I, these two pictures, I think, are a great example of um, how this works in real life. So in the anthro and religion research on Islam in Central Asia, we see competing groups and practices that fall somewhere along a spectrum and uh, I've kind of identified the, spect the spectrum as having two ends. This is not really mine um, originally, but in a survey of the literature, we can describe it like this. There's what I call text piety movements at one end and tradition and mysticism on the other. So the key difference between these two approaches is not actually that one is foreign and the other one is local but each rely on different sources of authority which provide the basis on which people make or justify moral and theological decisions. At the text piety end, primary authority is in the sacred texts, that is the Quran and the Hadiths. Those things that can't be justified or based on those texts are inadmissible. These Muslims emphasize personal piety and encourage one another to organize their individual lives around the instructions found in the sacred texts. And they emphasize an individual spiritual inner life devoted primarily to studying those texts and fulfilling the rules and rituals prescribed in them. On the traditional mystical end, authority comes from reproduction of and claims to faithfulness, to past precedent, to ancestral traditions, and sometimes from personal mystical experience, that is revealed knowledge, personal spiritual experiences that people have. Muslims at this end of the spectrum often emphasize the importance of community, family, and local ties rather than the individual focus of the text piety end. These are essentially two different modes of religious practice and epistemology, and they're common to many religions. The debate between strict scripturalists and mystical tradition has gone on in Central Asia and elsewhere for centuries. It's not a new problem created by the sudden introduction of foreign ideas like Salafism or Wahhabism, which fall very, fall very far to the left in this spectrum, and somehow, quote, local Islam or Sufism. Scholars like David Montgomery and Del Schwab, who identified these conflicting modes in Kyrgyzstan and Kazakhstan, respectively, have explained them by focusing on the way that religion is taught and how people reproduce religious knowledge. Those who place primary authority in the written texts are likely <coughs> to have more in common with other Muslims around the world reading the same text. While those who learn religion primarily by reproducing localized traditions and family practices, which are often tightly tied to geographic space, holy sites, and graves of ancestors and saints, will unsurprisingly have more local variation and be more closely shaped by local culture. A sharp growth in new field research shows that becoming more religious in Central Asia is at least as likely to motivate a believer to climb Mount Suleiman in Osh or visit a spirit healer in Andijan as it is to motivate them to memorize hadiths, grow a long beard, or wear hijab. Just as importantly, none of these latter have any more connection with whether or not that person adopts a desire to overthrow their government than does visiting a spirit healer. And here I have just a little bit of the relevant literature in case people are interested. 
and I'll go through this quickly and can come back to it. So third, and this is where we'll get into the real meat, um, where we can talk about these broad principles and concrete examples. So the third point here is that most of the independent religious literature is about figuring out how to be a good person. Analyses that have viewed Islamic revivalism primarily as a security issue have focused more narrowly on the rhetoric of extremists and political groups, usually in Uzbek, with the assumption that this rhetoric was dominant, was the dominant or significant part of all non-state Uzbek language religious discourse. Most people in the literature reviews that we've seen assume that it looks like this. But in reality, this guy is one of the most popular <laughs> independent religious authors, and we're going to talk a lot about him today. <laughs> In almost all cases, with the exception of one or two native scholars closely associated with the Uzbekistani government, the authors writing from a security focus can't read or speak Uzbek, and so they rely on secondary analysis, usually written by other analysts who also don't read or speak Uzbek. The rich discourse in independent Uzbek language religious media is completely left out of these analyses, and as is true of the theological emphasis of the religious revival, many of the assumptions made in the religion and security literature are unfounded or contradicted by primary sources, that is, in the discourses of Central Asian Muslims between and about themselves. In reality, instead, we find that there's a broad living conversation catalyzed by new media and sustained interest in religious approaches to organizing everyday life. The most popular and influential independent religious authors and teachers, even those whose work is forced underground in Uzbekistan because they've been banned by the state or arrested or killed, have little in common with radical groups like Hizbut Tahrir or the Islamic movement of Uzbekistan. The contemporary Uzbekistani state has justified itself and eliminated its opposition on the basis of claims to be the authentic protector of Uzbek independence and inheritor of an increasingly great and ever more ancient Uzbek national spirit. Having eliminated all credible political opposition in the early 1990s, the government has since turned to defining all aspects of cultural production, moral behavior, and even religious beliefs and practices as good or bad based on whether or not they conform to state-defined notions of Uzbekness or Uzbeklik, Uzbek values, and the popular catch-all phrase like Uzbek mentality. The proper or allowable or legal society, culture, religion, and individual behavior can be defined as what conforms to state-produced and situationally evolving definitions of Uzbek values or morals and must be compatible with evolving narratives in the nation's history that has produced this supposedly unique mentality. In a way that's immediately reminiscent of the Soviet period, the state frequently deploys various experts and authorities to define and delineate, usually in the negative, what is and is not Uzbek across all fields of human creative effort and cultural production, from art and literature to religion and personal morality. And it's precisely these experts who have often informed public perceptions about Islam and Uzbekistan and the Russian and Western press, and particularly in the religion and security literature that I described before. Actually, it was funny. Uh, Alexander and I had a conversation about one of these people last night at dinner, um, Bakhtiar Babajanov who's been very influential in this. Like the Soviet tradition of Samizdat literature, however, the heavy and active censorship regime does not prevent society and individuals from engaging in debates about their identity and sources of moral authority, and basic questions about what it means to do good, to live an admirable life, or what it means to be an Uzbek in the first place. As the country experiences a revival of interest in religious and specifically Muslim debates about these basic questions, new media like the Facebook group pictured here have facilitated a vibrant, quote, underground literature that has emerged of thinkers and writers and ordinary people from various backgrounds who engage in independent dialogue about these questions. Uzbeks use the freedom of communication given, them, given to them by the internet and new media to help each other navigate these competing discourses that we've talked about. They work together to discover what Islam is and how to live according to its rules and where to look for guidance. So this, um, this conversation, this thread that you see here on the right is an, an example of this. It was one, it's about a week, oh, it's October 22nd, it has a date right on it. Um, it's recent, it's from the page that I showed on the last slide. And in this, we have one guy, Uzbek, the traditional Uzbek people, <laughs> who, who is an avatar of the Statue of Liberty, 
who has encountered a new everyday problem that he doesn't know how to solve in terms of religious scholarship. They've got uh, some of the mobile phone companies in Uzbekistan have started allowing people to borrow money. Um, you're, you're allowed basically to go beyond, you usually pay ahead for your mobile phone services, and some of the mobile phone services, uh, which are mostly run by European companies, are allowing people to borrow over that. If you go over time, your phone doesn't just shut off, you're allowed to borrow over. But of course, they charge you a fee for this, because these are European companies and they're in this to make money. And this creates a dilemma for him. Is this fee an interest charge, and if it's an interest charge, is it allowed under Sharia? Is, if he, is he committing a sin if he pays an interest charge by borrowing money on his phone? So he has this question, he has no idea where to turn for answers, so he posts it on this internet discussion group, and all kinds of other people chime in, and they give him different opinions, and they suggest different authorities, and they suggest an authority that's based outside of Uzbekistan, and say, oh, wait a minute, I heard that that guy was a Salafi. We can't listen to him, or if we do listen to him, we shouldn't do it inside Uzbekistan, because we'll probably get arrested if we're reading this page. And then finally, at the end, this goes on really long for quite a while, because this is, this is something that's relevant to these people in their everyday life. They want to know if they accidentally talk too long on their phone, are they committing a sin that could possibly charge, cause them to be punished in the afterlife? So this is something that, that they take seriously. And towards the end, then finally, somebody puts a hyperlink. I love that now you can have hyperlinks to fatwas. Um, to, to a ruling by, and this is very common, uh, especially for Uzbeks, who aren't able to ask these questions of their neighborhood imams anymore, someone puts a hyperlink to a fatwa by Muhammad Sadiq Muhammad Yusuf. He says, yes, absolutely, this is interest, you're not allowed to do it, and that ends the discussion. They, he has a, a sort of supreme authority and they take that as the end of the discussion. So this is a good example of the way Uzbeks use new media to solve these problems um, among themselves, to navigate these debates. Another thing they use new media for is to preserve, reproduce, and allow access to independent voices on religion who have been repressed or banned by the Uzbek government. In spite of Uzbekistan's impressive censorship efforts and willingness to use state violence to silence voices, you'll notice that most of the people on this slide are dead, whose positions or popularity it finds threatening, internet-based new media has ensured that the work of popular Uzbek Muslim clerics and thinkers remains easily accessible even after their death, assassination, or exile. Today, then, I want to concentrate on two contemporary authors from the underground literature that originates or is preserved in new media. Unlike the imams above, actually neither of the authors we're going to talk about today are formally trained clerics, but they engage one another in, society, in the society that they live in on questions that are of deep importance to their audience. Produced under the threat of imprisonment for contradicting officially sponsored narratives, the questions that these authors and their readers are debating are abstract in nature, but have immediate physical consequences in real life. They determine many of the, uh, their other beliefs and actions and ultimately form opinions about what kind of state Uzbeks should live in, what kind of society they should form, and how to reach these goals once they're agreed on. These, in the end, are deeply political and practical issues. For the rest of the meat of this presentation, then, the real content analysis, I want to discuss the works of two authors, Hairullah Hamidov and Munib, who is also known as Ubaidullah Avob, though both of those are pseudonyms. No one I've talked to really knows who this person is. Hairullah Hamidov was born in 1975 and is among the most public and mainstream of all popular underground authors. And that's in great part because much of his work was originally published or broadcasted on legal commercial platforms and government approved websites before the publications were closed down under pressure and before his arrest on terrorism charges in January 2010. His arrest was unexpected and drew the attention of international media and human rights organizations primarily because he'd built a much wider reputation as a sports journalist before he actively began publishing and speaking on religious issues relatively recently in 2006 or 2007. He's trained as a print and broadcast journalist at Tashkent State University in the early 1990s and has no formal religious education, yet he's one of the most influential religious authors in the Uzbek language. Haminov is part of the first generation to come of age in the post-Soviet era. The trajectory of his life is representative of many of his young peers, and that's probably part of the key to his wide popularity and his side career as a charismatic and appealing religious teacher. His religious work includes sophisticated media projects on radio, video, and print, and across all these forms, he established a reputation for himself as a talented poet. 
Though all his other work has survived persecution by being spread virally across internet file sharing sites, his poetry seems to be what appeals to the broadest number of his fans and readers. And it's absolutely ubiquitous. If you get into the Uzbek internet, you'll find Hirola Hamidov's poems everywhere. He's on YouTube, he's on Facebook, he's on Anaklasniki, he's all over the internet. And actually, he's still, a lot of his content is still hosted at Islam.uz, which exists on the .uz government controlled domain in spite of the fact that he's in prison under terrorism charges. So it's a, the government was careful, I think, because of his popularity not to push too far. Munib, the second author that we're going to talk about today, is a Persian title that means roughly one who calls to repentance. He's the author of a major and unique underground work that first appeared in August 2010 in the aftermath of the bloody ethnic violence between Kyrgyz and Uzbeks in southern Kyrgyzstan. The violence shook the Uzbek-speaking community around the world and prompted a wide variety of responses and commentary wherever Uzbeks could speak freely. Among the clamor of voices searching for meaning and direction in this tragedy, Munib quietly published a two-part book-length response to the violence, addressing the situation in southern Kyrgyzstan specifically and the problems of human suffering and evil in general. The first commonality between these authors is that they write specifically in Uzbek for an Uzbek audience. They embrace and use specifically Uzbek cultural and literary forms and accept a number of claims about Uzbek identity that conform at first glance to many of the Uzbekistani government's main narratives. They write from a distinctly Muslim perspective and often write specifically to advance religious ends, that is to persuade or convert readers to accept and become more faithful to an international universalist religion but they do so in a specifically Uzbek idiom. Rather than rejecting ethnic or national identity in favor of a universal religious one, they affirm the existence and importance of Uzbeklik, this unique Uzbekness. In almost all cases, they borrow, to borrow a famous phrase from Soviet history, they accept the national in form but dispute the content, challenging the dominant official narratives about the past, present, and future. And this is where they get into trouble. Hamidov and Munib accept the official nationalist construction of Uzbek history that pushes the existence of the Uzbek people centuries or millennia into the past, far beyond when there were actual Uzbeks living in the current territory of Uzbekistan. They agree with the broad outlines of the official national history books. Uzbeks were the envy of all Central Asia, the most educated and civilized nation ever to live in the region, and the source of many great advances of world civilization. This projection of Uzbek history into ancient times accommodates the inclusion of a number of world-famous giants of Islamic civilization who were born or lived in the area that's today Uzbekistan. People like Imam al-Bukhari, Ibn Termizi, Ibn Sino, known as Avakena in the West, the father of modern medicine, and great medieval polymaths and philosophers Farabi, Biruni, and Khwarezmi, the mystic poet, uh, the mystic Bahuddin Naqshban, and the great Chagatai and Persian mystical poet Alashir Navai, who's a particular favorite of Munib. So none of these people were actually historically Uzbeks, but these authors accept that and they, they turn their own direction. These figures are accepted and often discussed, but the authors are much less interested in another category of national heroes, even more important in the official pantheon, and that's the conquerors. First among these is Amr Timur, whom the Karimov government has fashioned into the chief national symbol for Uzbekistan, and as Munim notes in a jab at Karimov, is often used in government propaganda as a cult of personality by proxy. This embrace of the Uzbeks' expanded nationalist history is selective and thereby sub subversive. It accepts the main thrust of the official narrative, that the Uzbeks are a grain and ancient people, but argues that the source of their greatness is not only some innate creativeness or brilliance in the Uzbek gene pool, though they don't deny that, but the light creative energy and moral clarity that come from Islam. This emphasis relegates mere strongmen like Amr Timur and by proxy his ersatz heir, Islam Karimov, to the backbench of history at best and the wrong side at worst. Thus, all, efforts are <coughs> all the efforts undertaken by official cultural production apparatus to consistently remind the contemporary Uzbeks of their past, the explosion of rebuilt and restored architecture the, of the great Muslim empires, the museums, statues, the history books, all of these become fields of contested meaning, ubiquitous symbols for the author's argument that the light, the nur of Islam, is the key element in Uzbek history. 
Expanded narratives about the past greatness of the Uzbek nation are deployed by the official cultural production apparatus to imply that the current government, having inherited this mantle of national achievements, can surely lead the Uzbek nation to a future as bright and great as the past. These narratives are selectively accepted by the underground authors, but they do exactly the opposite. They appropriate the narratives of past greatness instead as a weapon against the present, as a scathing tool for criticizing not only the present government, but society as a whole. Narratives of the present for both authors are grim, bordering in Munib's case on literally apocalyptic. The past greatness of Uzbeks is only a sign of the height from which they've fallen. Hamidov's best known work is a long poem called What is Becoming of the Uzbeks, in which the final line of each stanza repeats the title question with an intensity that builds as the text becomes more dire with each stanza. Once the Uzbeks produced the great scholars, poets, and theologians of their age, but now what? Once the Uzbeks were the masters of all Central Asia, but today even the wild Turkmen can stand and mock them. If once the Uzbeks were a light to all nations, today they've plunged into such darkness that the very opposite of true is true. Hamidov says, any kind of foreign-born person who accidentally stumbles into Uzbekistan is a candle lit for everyone in the night. What's becoming of the Uzbeks? Munib is so taken with this poetic assessment of the present day that he not only quotes it extensively, but writes his own poem as a tribute to Hamidov, including Hamidov's arrest and secret trial as further evidence that the Uzbeks have lost their way and slipped very far off the path that led them to their past greatness. So throughout both authors' work, important groups of negative symbols reoccur in their texts that they used to describe what they view as the collapse of the status quo. Although these are in many ways universal religious symbols, they have a specific meaning for the discourse of the Uzbek past and present. And for the sake of brevity, I'll just look at three of these today. So this first is darkness and light. Contrast between dark, light and dark, day and night, is a master symbol of Islamic literature and spirituality. Darkness symbolizes the status quo for these authors, today's Uzbeks, the minds and hearts of men in the absence of light. And that light, of course, is nur, the light of God, the message of the prophet that reveals the true will of God. Sleep, uklash, in addition to being associated with darkness, represents the mind that lies idle and unresponsive to nur and is closely related to ignorance. For Hamidah and Munib, sleep prevents the individual or a whole society from realizing their true potential, their true identity, or even their true humanity. Withering, the last one that I sort of skipped over there, is used in slightly different ways by both authors in the specific sense of a living thing that withers prematurely, failing to reach its potential. This symbol is used sometimes to refer to the entire Uzbek people, who according to the authors are failing to live up to the promises of their rich history. Other times, as in the poem The Heavy Burden, it refers to Hamidov's post-independence generation, to whom it seemed the whole world would be opened after the fall of communism, and who it seemed would be the first Uzbek generation in a century to be able to engage the world around them and have the freedom to make their own choices about what it means to be Muslim, to be Uzbek, to be a journalist, a poet, a cleric, or any other path that they chose. Hamidov's own imprisonment, separation from his family, and public condemnation by the Uzbek state is a powerful symbol of the fate of tens of thousands of religiously active or globally inquisitive members of this generation, and Munib's tribute to Hamidov conveys this explicitly. This is a, just a section from that. And this slide looks weird, but I promise it'll make sense in just a minute. In spite of the text's open defiance of official narratives and sharp criticism of the government of Uzbekistan, neither of them ultimately blames the state for the problems of society. Unlike Islamist literature that focuses on regime change and implementation of religious values or sharia from above, the worst problems with the status quo, from ethnic violence in Kyrgyzstan to oppression of religiously active Muslims in Uzbekistan, are portrayed as social failings rooted in individual moral choices. Unjust government is a form of suffering, according to Munib, and <coughs> one that's an acute reality for Uzbeks all over Central Asia and a frequent theme in all these texts. But worse than that is the betrayal by brothers, by one's own people, who sell one another out for a little bit of earthly power. 
The real problem that has to be addressed, and for which both authors offer a religious solution, is the failure of individuals to act morally in their given circumstances and fulfill their duties to their families, to their Uzbek brothers and sisters, and to their fellow Muslims. In Hamidov's poem Majnun Tol, which is the willow tree, he levels his most poignant criticism at the Uzbek government for creating an atmosphere of moral decay with a clever graphic symbol of a willow tree in the National Garden where immoral young men lure virgin schoolgirls to be deflowered. I told you this would make sense. <laughs> Even here, <coughs> the state has created an infrastructure for one of the more explicit signs of moral collapse available in religious vocabulary. But Hamidov lays the blame for what happens under the willow tree on society itself on the family and ultimately on individuals who abandon their duty to protect their daughters and sisters from young men whose parents and family had failed to teach them to behave correctly. So while governments might be bad and it might be the lot of many to suffer injustice from above, the focus of both authors is on changing society from below, one individual, one family, one neighborhood at a time. This brings our focus to the primary question of this paper, what kind of change do they propose? If Uzbeks must better themselves as individuals, what does it mean to be a good person, to be a good Muslim or a good Uzbek? The first step to a good life for Hamidov and Munib, as is evident in Hamidov's comments above, is to accept individual agency and responsibility. Though they also stress the importance of fulfilling duties to family and community, which are primary traditional Uzbek values, this does not relieve each person from a highly modern and almost existentialist construction of individual moral responsibility. The next step after accepting individual agency is to apply it to becoming a better Muslim. The light of the Prophet and the teaching of Islam are presented as the ultimate blueprint that underlie being good in all the categories, whether that's being a good Uzbek, including being a good Uzbek. The authors argue that while you can't <coughs> While you can be a good Muslim without being a good Uzbek, you can't be a good Muslim or even a good pan uh, I'm sorry, you can't be a good Uzbek or a good pan Turk without being a good Muslim. Uzbeklik, being Uzbek, is a blood tie, a broad family that each Uzbek is born into. And since God is all powerful and all wise, and all things have a purpose, including being born into the family of Uzbeks, uh, um, this theocentric perspective on Uzbeklik sacralizes ethno-national belonging and identity. Being a good Uzbek is part of each Muslim Uzbek's duty before God, just as is being a good son or daughter, a good brother or sister, and eventually a good husband, wife, and parent. So in these constructions, the imaginary wall that compartmentalizes modern national identity and a universalist or pre-modern religion is erased for these authors and their fellow travelers. Islam is another element of habitus or identity that composes the imagined nation. A common religion is explicitly and enthusiastically added to language, history, origin story, culture, and territory that define what it means to be Uzbek. Being a good person, a good Muslim, and an Uzbek are therefore intertwined together for those whose fate it was to be born Uzbeks. Each person has to take individual moral responsibility for their circumstances, whatever circumstances God decided to place him or her in, rich or poor, Uzbek or Kyrgyz, free or oppressed. For as many political implications as there are in the underground attacks on the status quo, this is, there's remarkably little that's immediately political about these definitions of right belief and right behavior. Their theology varies little, if at all, from the teaching of the state-sponsored mufti out of Uzbekistan. Yet their work is at the same time full of political consequences, as are their lives. According to this literature, being a good Muslim and a good Uzbek means that each person has a duty to protect the oppressed, to pursue justice, to refuse to, follow, to allow states created by men to dictate the terms of religion or put secular national identity above a religious national one. If the authors argue that they live in an unjust state that oppresses its people or that the state will not allow them to be faithful Muslims and good citizens at the same time, then this conflict becomes fraught with consequences. At present, these consequences appear to come mostly in the form of more suffering for the authors, their families, and their readers. Since his conviction in May 2010, Hirola Hamidov and his family has been mostly silent until February of last year when Dilnoza, his wife, contacted a reporter for RFERL's Uzbek service to give them an update and pass on a poem that he'd written in prison and given to her. The poem, uh, this is the last stanza of the poem, 
And what comes before this is a long, mournful catalog of all the loved ones and relatives left behind, the pain and shame caused to daughters, mothers, <coughs> mothers, wives, and fathers of the prisoners who've been separated from them and may never see them again, each one heaping new grief on the prisoners themselves. Though the final stanza is optimistic, the anguish list above it weighs on those five lines in a way that's almost palpable. So Aminov says, we'll still be vindicated if he himself wills it. We'll embrace the sky's sun. When we return to freedom, if God wills it, we'll wipe the tears from all their eyes and we won't test their endurance again. And this feels like it has two meanings in it to me. And I've asked a lot of other people what they think. It seems like it could be repentant and defiant at the same time. <laughs> You're not sure whether he's saying once the state releases them, they'll come back and they won't make these same mistakes again. Or he's saying that sooner or later, justice will happen and the government will be overthrown and they'll be freed that way. But either way, there's a lot of ambiguity. There's a lot of pain. There's a lot of guilt in this. And there's that's sort of where we're ending, actually. There isn't a resolution to this, just like there isn't for Hamidov and his family and for all the rest of these Muslims. This is the situation that they're stuck in. Um, so hopefully, appropriately or symbolically, that's where we're going to end. So thank you.